Welcome um, and good afternoon and it's evening here to this session on how uh, to navigate telehealth. I'm very happy to be here and I have, I'm very honored also to have and introduce my um, the presenters of this session. My name is Maurice Weisenbeek. I'm a pulmonologist and head of the ILD Center in the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And we have two great talks. The first one will be on how to prepare for a telehealth um, visit, and it will be given by uh, Marie-Luz Fuentes, who is a physician at Doctors on Demand, so who knows a lot about care um, at a distance. And the second talk will be um, from Toby Maher, who's a professor in medicine at Gex University, uh, Gex Hospital of the University of uh, California in Los Angeles, and who's a very well-known um, ILD physician with a special interest also in home monitoring and home spirometry. So I think we have two great speakers, and they have pre-recorded their sessions, and these will uh, be played hat to hat. Um, and afterwards, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So we're very much looking forward to discussion and to getting your questions in the chat box. Um, so please put your questions, and I look forward to seeing you at the Q&A. I'm Mary Lou Fuentes, um, and I am a family physician currently working in um, telehealth for the past four years. Uh, I'm also a patient with uh, pulmonary fibrosis that recently underwent um, a double lung transplant. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation for inviting me to present this topic today. I also would like to um, thank the patients, the pulmonary fibrosis community, and the caregivers. Um, you, we are the reason we're here today in this meeting. Um, let's begin with the topic that I was asked to discuss today, how to navigate um, telehealth. Let's uh, go to an overview. Um, we'll discuss what, what is telehealth. How do we prepare for a telehealth visit? Uh, I'd like to touch on um, how patients should do monitoring from home, um, how they should do the spirometer. And we, we will talk about remote uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. And at the end, uh, we'll discuss um, how to navigate the uncertainties. What is telehealth? Telehealth is the use of electronic information and telecommunication technology services to provide healthcare when a patient and a healthcare provider are not in the same room in the same vicinity. I'd like to talk a little bit about the evolution. <laughs> well, uh, telehealth has been around for a number of years. It had become more popular with our recent uh, global health crisis. With the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, telehealth emerged from a trend to a mainstream. It had moved the healthcare from the traditional setting, doctor offices, um, hospital, into the houses of patients' houses where people leave, play, and work. Telehealth had multiple benefits um, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It expanded um, healthcare, uh, facilitated care needed to patients while practicing social distancing and therefore reducing contact um, exposure for patients as well as healthcare providers. Uh, it also reduced the use of personal protective equipment, um, letting uh, that, making that available for, to use for emergency departments and some doctor's offices. It also, um, save time and expenses for patients. Um, telehealth has advanced and continued to grow uh, exponentially. Um, the transition to telehealth has been an adjustment for patients and uh, healthcare providers. By using technology, telehealth has provided care at distance, such as routine cares, um, acute visits, consultations, medication refills, uh, monitoring chronic illnesses. Telehealth provided one-on-one -on -one, um, interactions with your um, provider. When you, when you have that interaction, there is no other 
um, limitations. That there's not other, um, um, it's just you and your healthcare provider. Um, there is no commute. Uh, it is done from the comfort of your house. Appointments are obtained sooner than in-person um, appointments. However, telehealth has its limitations. It relies on internet, Wi-Fi connection, uh, is limited, uh, that might be limited in rural, uh, remote areas. It requires technology devices and limits um, assessments and, and physical examination. Um, let's talk about what patients should do um, and how they, they should be prepared to get the best of a telehealth visit. Uh, the first thing is just setting up your uh, electronic equipment. Um, it is very important, like I said before, for patients to be prepared ahead of time for a telehealth visit, to be able to have a productive, optimal visit, and to ensure that you receive the care you need. Remember, all things that makes a great in-person visit applies to a uh, telehealth visit. Um, set up an um, electronic equipment. Make sure that... Um, your, um, your device is uh, fully charged, that you're familiar with um, your computer or your laptop or your um, mobile devices. During the pandemic, many practices um, ran into the telemedicine, but did not have the adequate uh, tools and healthcare providers were uh, thrown into these without any uh, training. So this is a process of learning. Um, I also would like to uh, make sure that you patients do check with their um, insurance company just to make sure that the, uh, the coverage, that there is coverage for your telehealth visit and what kind of copay do you uh, need to uh, um, charge, I mean, to provide. Um, and again, that's it, so setting up your electronic equipment, uh, either your mobile device, your laptop, your desktop, your iPad, Make sure that that um, device is fully charged, that you have a, uh, a good internet connection, Wi-Fi connection. Um, if your um, provider uh, sends you a link, uh, make sure uh, that you download uh, that, that uh, appropriate uh, uh, app um, or, or uh, download the software that is required to open that visit. A, there might be a link asking you to connect at a time of their appointment. So make sure that you're on time, that you, um, uh, that you device, that you download that uh, application ahead of time. Uh, I'd like for you to, um, I suggest for you to find a good um, quality uh, location in your house for your appointment. Uh, make sure that this is a, um, a quiet area that has a good natural light. Um, um, avoid any bright back background or having like a window in the in the back that uh, is not going to give you a good um, a good um, uh, options for your visit. Uh, make sure you turn off all notifications uh, um, or put do not disturb uh, mode in your uh, electronic device uh, so you can have the full attention um, and the full um, commitment to your visit. <laughs> um, I'd like for you to, I recommend for you to write a list of questions, problems, and concern um, in, um, in having a, a notepad with you where you can actually write uh, recommendations that your healthcare provider might uh, suggest at the time of the visit. Um, I'd like for you to um, have a, a ready your past medical history your vaccination history, um, um, or if you're an existing patient, make sure that you provide an updated um, uh, uh, recent um, changes in your healthcare. Um, uh, if you have any new allergies, uh, make sure you provide it to your healthcare provider. Uh, it's good to have a, a good list of, of your medications that, that are updated. Um, and also don't forget to mention the over-the-counter medication that might interact with your uh, current medications and be ready to provide an update to your healthcare provider. Be on time uh, and ready for the visit. Uh, also, you should uh, uh, provide a consent to be treated. 
um, if you like, you can bring someone else, um, your um, healthcare, your um, caregiver, your spouse, somebody uh, into the visit that you can send to be present um, that also um, would remember what, what it was said during the visit. Um, let's also talk about how to collect your vital signs and be prepared for your visit. Uh, this is what we call home monitoring. We have several tools uh, that patients uh, should use to be prepared for the visit. Uh, we have a, a blood pressure. Um, this actually, these devices collect your vital signs. A blood pressure monitor. Uh, this is to self um, measure your own blood pressure. Get one that is accurate and in good quality that wraps around your arm um, with a large or regular cuff, depending on the size of your arm. And uh, I'd like to suggest one that is not uh, complicated, that has a good um, bright screen uh, to check your blood pressure uh, after resting for five minutes um, without having your leg cross and make sure you write down um, your blood pressure and have it ready. Um, have a thermometer and we have a different um, varieties. We have a digital thermometer with the um, pandemic, those uh, infrared uh, thermometers um, became very popular and a lot of patients who have one of their houses. Um, so make sure you check your temperature and write it down. I also uh, recommend to have a weight scale. Uh, that's, a, that's an important tool. Um, there are some uh, electronic devices like the one that I have in the, on the slide uh, that collects data and populates directly into your phone and keeps a log of all your your um, weights during the week and monthly, and you can actually follow a trend and discuss that with your healthcare provider. Uh, spirometers, especially for patients that have chronic uh, lung diseases are important to monitor your lung function. And I'll discuss that a little bit in more detail later. Uh, pulse oximeter, most of the patients are very familiar with that. Um, I'll talk to that in, in detail a little bit later as well that measures your oxygen saturation, your blood oxygen saturation. And if you have diabetes and need to monitor your blood, your blood sugars, um, also make sure you can use some uh, blood sugar uh, monitoring devices. Uh, the home spirometer is a very important tool that collects data in patients with chronic pulmonary diseases and also, also uh, used for um, monitor lung function in patients, the post-transplant uh, patients. It allows for a peak uh, expiratory flow and uh, for forced expiratory volume in one second. Uh, the illustration that I have here, there are two different uh, devices in here. Um, the one in the, both collect data, the one in the, in, in, uh, the one on the left is easy to use, is recommended for patients from five to uh, 95. And it blows, uh, the person blows directly into the device and data gets collected and transmitted via uh, USB port into the computer. The device on the right is, uh, has a Bluetooth capability. And once the app is download into your mobile device, uh, it collects data. It's very easy to use. It's battery uh, operated and uh, easy to assemble. It has uh, the, ter the turbinate switch and turn and patients open the app and gets ready to make a deep breath and do as fast as they can and blow it into the device. Into the device. It takes um, three measurements and recall, records an average, um, uh, the peak, um, the force respiratory volume in one, in one second and is very accurate. Data is called coordinated and patients can easily follow their target um, range and with data, identify early changes in their uh, pulmonary function and actually um, call their doctor ahead of time and, and report uh, those changes. Now, those uh, the device on the right has a cell phone. Uh, it pairs with the cell phone. It has Bluetooth uh, capability and transfer all the data. And patients can actually email um, their results directly to their provider. It's really um, convenient. Now, I'd like to talk about uh, remote uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. Now, what is pulmonary rehabilitation? Um, it's, um, 
it, pulmonary rehabilitation is the delivery, delivery of rehabilitation devices via um, information uh, and, and communication technologies. Um, it's highly effective. Um, pulmonary rehabilitation is a highly effective treatment that monitors uh, lung function and lung capacity and provides an overall well being for patients with chronic uh, lung diseases. It increases uh, walking distance and tolerance to exercise. In person, pulmonary rehabilitation is the most effective and safe service for patients where blood pressure, heart rate, pulse oximetry and protection of breathlessness can be closely monitored. However, um, access to it in person pulmonary rehabilitation is limited to location, uh, transportation, uh, patients uh, in rural remote uh, areas where distance of transportation plays an important limitation. Patients um, having their own uh, physical limitations such as requiring an oxygen um, therapy or having ambulation issues is also limited the, the, uh, for them to go for in-person pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, many uh, patients did not complete their pulmonary rehabilitation um, sessions or were reluctant to return because of fears of exposure of the virus. Some centers initially uh, operated with minimal number of patients uh, to maintain social distancing and kept their um, staff and patients um, safe, to keep the staff and patients uh, safe. Um, there are several models for um, pulmonary remote uh, pulmonary rehabilitation that were introduced uh, in order to help patients continue to do pulmonary rehabilitation. A few programs in the United States offer uh, either virtual based pulmonary rehabilitation remote for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And the cost is usually not covered by Medicare. Uh, the American um, Association for Cardiovascular and Res Respiratory Care and the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation uh, developed free virtual um, pulmonary, rehab pulmonary rehab resources. Um, having, in, have in mind that remote uh, pulmonary rehabilitation is not for every patient and does not replace us in person pulmonary rehabilitation. Virtual sessions might be suitable for some patients. Your healthcare provider will be able to determine if this is suitable for you. We have three models, the home model, the center-based model, and the web-based uh, model. Uh, the home uh, model, um, and thanks to the uh, these two organizations that I previously mentioned, there are some uh, videos in the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation um, a website. The home base, those are there's, there's a series of videos um, for beginners, um, which concentrate more in posture and breathing. Uh, there's also some home base videos for intermediate patients and be used for more advice, advanced uh, patients. This basically everything that is done needs to be monitored and approved by your healthcare provider um, before you initiate any kind of sessions. Now the center base, uh, those are uh, for remote um, pulmonary rehabilitation. Patients can come to a, uh, the model, uh, patients can rural patients that are in, in other areas can come to a, a center that is closer to them, them. And this center can be monitored by a larger center. Uh, that um, So making this a little bit more accessible for patients to attend. Uh, the wave, the, the web-based uh, uh, model uh, requires training patients, uh, providing the necessary equipment teaching the patient how to self-monitor and lock their patient. And they will be, um, patients will be monitored through uh, a website. Uh, but again, again, requires for the patients to have uh, the equipment at home uh, and um, having been trained um, how to self-monitor their own vital signs. Let's talk a little bit about um, uh, what implies navigating the uncertainties. 
uh, remote patient uh, monitoring re uh, places a challenge since um, the patients are the ones responsible to self-monitor the uh, vital signs and reporting um, this self-reporting the shortness of breath. Um, how patients respond to uh, the interaction of telehealth might vary. Uh, some patients might not be very familiar with uh, uh, telehealth and they might not have uh, they might not feel that they have a, uh, the same uh, care or response or interaction that they have if they were to have an in-person in uh, encounter with their, their physician uh, and might not be familiar with the technology. So uh, for there's a difference between acute and routine uh, visits. Um, patients that have acute visit might require a more in detail self-examination uh, routine visits um, are a little bit easier, uh, as well as um, uh, medication refills. The physical examination provides uh, a challenge. Um, usually physical examination is self-guided. Um, we tell the patient how to, guide the patient how to examine themselves. Um, it requires some equipment. Um, Telehealth might reduce disparities in health uh, care and improve remote um, rural areas care. Uh, however, uh, patients in uh, remote areas may not have adequate um, internet or Wi-Fi. There are just a few carriers and that makes um, a higher cost. Uh, the patients might not have the uh, the, uh, the devices required to connect with um, a telehealth uh, provider. So that plays uh, uh, um, a problem. So in reducing the disparities and in, in, in increasing um, healthcare outcomes. So in summary, um, telehealth is a novel uh, tool that modernized healthcare and have increased the access to healthcare. It also allowed for maintaining social distancing while getting the care that you need. We have to remember that patients need to have the, the right technology, uh, the right internet, the Wi-Fi, the connection, the means to do that. Patients also need, need to be prepared for the visit. They need to collect the uh, the blood pressure, the vital signs, the um, pulse oximetry, uh, make sure that they have the equipment for, uh, to provide spirometry at home and uh, be ready for the visit. I, it's important for patients to consider remote pulmonary rehabilitation if it's uh, available in their area, but it must uh, be discussed with their primary care physician or provider. And we all have in mind, keep in mind that telehealth does not replace um, in-person visit and it has its limitations. With that, I conclude uh, my presentation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Togmar, I'm Professor of Medicine and Director of the Interstitial Lung Disease Program at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And I'm gonna be talking to you today about home monitoring, home spirometry, uh, remote pulmonary rehabilitation and navigating the uncertainties. These are my disclosures. Uh, and this is what I hope to cover in the talk. So I'm gonna give a, an overview of home monitoring, what that means, I'm going to talk through specifically home spirometry and the pros and cons of undertaking it. I'm going to review the evidence for pulmonary rehabilitation and remote pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, and then summarize at the end by discussing what we do know uh, and what we don't know but need to know in the future. So really, home monitoring um, has been something that has been developing gradually over the last 10 or 15 years. It's been driven by developments in technology, uh, the advent of wearable tech such as uh, watches and things like Fitbits that can monitor 
our step count and even our pulse uh, and ECGs. Uh, it's also been driven um, by the development of cloud computing and the ease now of collecting data from multiple sources uh, and storing it in one central place. Uh, and there's also been a development in, in medical technology with miniaturization of devices to be able to record, for instance, spirometry or ECGs or oxygen saturations or blood glucose levels. And that's, that's led on um, to the development of home monitoring programs, not just in pulmonary fibrosis, but also across a wide range of, of medical diseases. And that's been driven by the idea that home monitoring is going to help us um, intervene before problems develop. So if we use pulmonary fibrosis as an example, the ideal um, scenario would be for us to be able to identify when someone is on the cusp of developing an infection or a, an acute exacerbation so that we can intervene with treatment early uh, when that treatment is more likely to be successful. And the same is being done in trying to identify people in the lead up to heart attacks uh, or identifying individuals with diabetes that's becoming poorly controlled so that medical interventions can be undertaken uh, in advance of, of problems developing. And the other role, role for home monitoring is, is really in providing medical care to people who live long distances away from healthcare provision. So people who live in rural areas, uh, or when we think about pulmonary fibrosis, people who just live a long distance away from dedicated centers. Uh, and the, the growth of home monitoring now allows uh, patients who live distant from from specialist centers to still access specialist care uh, without uh, having to necessarily travel many hours uh, to see the healthcare team in person or to undergo testing in person. And of course, everything has been accelerated over the last 18 months following the COVID pandemic uh, in many countries around the world, in many states across the US, we've seen lockdowns which have uh, prevented um, patients getting to hospitals. We've seen um, barriers in place to stop the spread of, of COVID in hospitals, which has meant it's been difficult at times to undertake monitoring such as, as lung function. Uh, and of course, um, people have, have been rightly anxious about attending hospital unnecessarily, particularly early in the pandemic, uh, when there was a lot of spread of disease in healthcare facilities. And so that's led to a huge growth in um, the use of telemedicine. We've all now got much more comfortable uh, at using video techniques. Of course, we're having this meeting over the internet and really we've seen this, this huge growth in um, video communication platforms that have allowed the delivery uh, of telemedicine to patients. And at the same time, it's accelerated the drive for developing home monitoring strategies. Um, and this, this study here is a nice study that was published uh, a couple of months ago. It was undertaken by Marlies Fiesenbeck and her group in Holland, and I was fortunate enough to participate. Uh, and what Marlies and her students did was send out a questionnaire to healthcare providers around the world uh, they got almost 300 replies from different healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, uh, other healthcare professionals. Uh, and, and what they were doing was asking a number of questions about um, healthcare providers' experience of providing uh, telemedicine health for patients with interstitial lung disease during the COVID era. Uh, and a number of questions were asked. This was the first one. What have been the effects of the COVID pandemic on e-health use? You can see that a small percentage of, of healthcare providers were already using e-health platforms, but that was less than 10%. During the pandemic, almost 50% of providers have additionally started using e-health. Uh, and of the providers that weren't using e-health, many of them are planning to do so once uh, they have access to the relevant technology. The next question is, what are your preferences and current use of home monitoring? You can see that the current use is in the pale blue bars. Uh, the, the, 
the desired use is in the dark blue bars. So uh, less than half of centers are managing to measure home-based oxygen saturations, but almost all the healthcare providers would like to do that if possible. The same is true with symptom scores, information on side effects, um, measurement of physical activity or exercise, the sort of data that is collected by a Fitbit, for instance, uh, data on quality of life measurements and, and also home spirometry. And you can see that the aspiration of the home of the healthcare providers is, is far in excess of, of what is being used at the moment, speaking to uh, a sort of great desire to be able to offer patients um, interventions closer to home uh, and to be able to provide um, home monitoring of disease without needing to come up to the hospital. And then the other question was, what are the hurdles for implementing home monitoring? And most of the hurdles are around uh, technical factors, not having the equipment available, reimbursement, and then concerns about the re reliability of available equipment, privacy issues, uh, and the ethics of collecting data that's going to be stored uh, in a centralized fashion. And of course, these are all important issues that will need to be overcome uh, as we look to deliver uh, care closer to home in the future. So moving on to the next topic, which is home spirometry. Uh, this is something that uh, myself and others have been looking at for over a decade now. And I thought I'd talk you through some of the data. Um, so we set up a study back in 2010, um, while I was back working in London, where we gave 50 of our patients um, a home spirometer. And, and at the time it was a very simple device. It wasn't internet connected. Um, it didn't really have an algorithm to decide whether a patient had done a good blow for their spirometry. Uh, and the only way to collect the data was for the, the individual concern to write the numbers down uh, in a paper diary and then bring them back to us um, after three months. But we, we did a few things to try and standardize the spirometry. We provided training at the beginning and after one month. We asked that people just did their best blow once a day, but every day. Uh, normally, when you have lung function performed in the hospital, uh, when you do spirometry, you're asked to do three good blows, and we keep the reading of the best one. But we realized that this might be burdensome, so we just asked for a single blow. Um, as a sort of safety blanket, we asked if people could contact us if they saw a consistent drop uh, in their force vital capacity uh, on three consecutive days. And so these were the patients we recruited, a fairly typical uh, cohort of IPF patients, predominantly men uh, in their late 60s uh, with moderately severe disease. And the first thing we did was to see how well the home spirometry compared to hospital-based spirometry. And actually, it does surprisingly well. You can see here that it correlates very closely. Um, but the one thing we noticed was that the home spirometry tends to slightly underestimate uh, the true value of FBC. And that's probably because uh, when you don't have a, a lung function technician shouting at you to breathe out as far as possible, you will tend to not breathe out quite as much. However, that underestimate was very consistent over time and it didn't really affect the accuracy of the home spirometry. This here just shows um, the overall change in spirometry over the 52 weeks of the study in the whole population. Uh, and you can see that there was gradual decline over time. This here is an example of an individual patient performing the spirometry. So this is one patient who's done the spirometry every day for a year and a half. Each dot on that graph is a single FVC measurement. And you can appreciate that there is day by day variability. However, you can also appreciate that over time, we, we can see the trajectory of the lung function, which unfortunately is one of decline. It might be said that all of this was done before the availability of antifibrotic therapy. So we're really looking here at the behavior of IPF without treatment. Um, this here is another individual with more rapidly progressive disease. And you can perhaps appreciate that the rate of decline in his force vital capacity is much greater than the first patient's. 
And then this here is an example of a third patient who had an acute exacerbation in the middle of the study. Uh, and so you can perhaps appreciate that after 180 days, there is this sudden decline in his force vital capacity measurements. Uh, and this was associated with an increase in symptoms and cough. Uh, you can also perhaps appreciate that all th although things uh, stabilize afterwards, uh, they never quite recover back to baseline. And of course, this is an example of an event that we would love to be able to intervene on early so that we can prevent uh, irreversible loss of lung function going forward. And then this is the CT scan of a slightly different patient just illustrating the sort of issue that we're trying to capture. This is the example of an acute exacerbation. You can see the increase in ground glass attenuation on this CT scan, uh, which gets worse uh, over a period of two or three weeks. And this is the situation we want to avoid with home monitoring. This graph just speaks to the average change that we saw in patients over the 52 weeks of the study. Each line on the graph is an individual patient, and you can see that there is a spectrum of disease behavior. Um, some people were stable over the 52 weeks. Some patients had rapidly progressive disease, and the average patient, and as I've said, this was before treatment, uh, lost about 9% of FVC over the 52 weeks. And one of the other important factors was that this change in FVC over a period of time as short as three months actually predicted outcome. So we were able to tell very quickly with the home monitoring uh, whether patients were likely to do well in the future or whether their disease was progressing. And now that we have treatments available, that does offer the opportunity to think about um, treatment change uh, and management of, of background therapy for patients' fibrosis. So leading on from that study, which demonstrated the feasibility of being able to undertake home spirometry, um, Marlies Wiesenbeck and her group have then uh, gone on to look at a number of other elements of performing uh, home spirometry with individuals with pulmonary fibrosis. And in this study here, published three years ago now, uh, they undertook a pilot assessment of home spirometry in 10 patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And really, they wanted to understand the barriers and challenges to delivering uh, home spirometry effectively for routine clinical practice. Uh, and within their manuscript, they include this table, which usefully looks at the different challenges and barriers that we encounter in trying to perform home spirometry with patients. And just to take you through some of those challenges, um, there is the issue of internet access. Not everyone has it, but increasingly we can use tablets and phones uh, with 4G or 5G enablement as a way of uh, providing information back to the hospital clinic so that patients can be monitored in real time. There is an issue of the quality of measurements that are collected. Um, this is a technological challenge and Fortunately, spirometer devices are continuing to improve and the internal algorithms within the devices are improving to ensure uh, that the data collected is of high quality. There are some technical issues around how patients use spirometers. And again, as we see the development of the technology, this is tending to improve. There are issues of motivation. Um, now, when you perform spirometry in the hospital, it tends to be done with a lung function technician, and they will provide both training uh, and motivation as the individual performs the forced expiratory maneuver. In the home, you don't have that same thing. You don't have someone shouting over your shoulder. Um, but the, again, we're seeing technological developments with the devices that are providing incentives to individuals to try and provide a maximum expiratory maneuver. Uh, and there's also a move to think about using video consultations to supervise some of the spirometry so that we can uh, oversee the actual process of doing it. Then there's the issue that spirometry might induce coughing. Uh, this is not an easy one to deal with. Uh, but we have tried to develop strategies for minimizing cough, such as only performing the spirometry maneuver once in a day, rather than going for the best of three measurements as we might do in a hospital setting. 
And of course, having the more measurements as we do with each daily measurement actually overcome some of the challenges from only doing the one rather than the three. Uh, there was also, when we started doing home spirometry, the concern that patients seeing their own results may um, perhaps become depressed or anxious as a consequence of seeing their readings get worse. However, in practice, what we've seen is that by empowering patients to monitor their own disease, we've actually improved psychological well-being. So it, it may well be that putting patients in control of their condition by allowing home monitoring uh, actually uh, improves rather than worsens the situation. And then, of course, there's the challenge that doing spirometry uh, may be bothersome or it may be something that gets forgotten in a busy day. Uh, and there are things that we can do from the provider side uh, to try and both motivate patients to perform readings, um, but also to assist patients when the readings become difficult to perform. And then this was another study uh, undertaken by um, Katharina Moore, uh, one of Marlisa's PhD students and published last year in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. And in this study, they assigned patients either to standard of care or home monitoring um, with home spirometry. And the end point of the study was to look at change in quality of life measured with the K-Build uh, questionnaire. So this is a questionnaire uh, that asks about various facets of quality of life. Uh, and what you can see here in the graph on the left um, is that the dark bars represent the patients who had home monitoring. The lighter bars represent those who didn't. There weren't statistically significant differences between the groups. However, there was a trend towards improved quality of life in the patients who had the home monitoring. Uh, and the biggest difference was in the psychological domain. So again, speaking to the fact that when you put people in control of their own disease, it actually has a positive impact on their psychological well-being. And the other observation from the study was that in patients in the home monitoring group, there were more likely to be adjustments to medication, either dose adjustments or changes in treatment uh, based on, on home, home measurements of, of false vital capacity. And then the other area in which home monitoring has been useful is in clinical trials. Um, this was a, a study performed with perfenidone in patients with unclassifiable ILD. But this was the first study to use home spirometry as a primary endpoint. Um, we found that people successfully performed spirometry, but we did have a number of technical challenges, which was that the spirometers weren't quite as good as we hoped in, correct, in collecting uh, correct data. And furthermore, we had problems in analyzing the data in patients who didn't undertake enough readings. However, we've learned a huge amount from that clinical trial, which I think will allow us to better use home spirometry in clinical trials in the future, and perhaps make trials less intrusive for patients to participate in. And then moving on to the last part of my talk, the pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, we know that pulmonary rehabilitation is a positive thing for patients with pulmonary fibrosis, that undertaking a structured educational and exercise program both improves uh, well-being, but also improves exercise capacity uh, and six-minute walk distance. Uh, now, of course, during the pandemic, it's been very hard to offer in-hospital um, rehabilitation. So a lot of work has gone into developing um, video-enabled rehabilitation programs. And although this is still a work in progress, there are now a number of small studies that have been published showing that it is feasible to deliver pulmonary rehabilitation by video consultation, and that such rehabilitation actually has positive benefits in terms of exercise capacity and quality of life. And so I think, again, this is an opportunity for the future, not just um, to avoid patients being exposed to infection, but also to open up the opportunity of rehabilitation to individuals who live a long way away uh, from dedicated ILD or IPF centers. So really to summarize all of that, we've seen a lot of technological advance in the last decade that now makes home monitoring feasible. Um, 
from a pulmonary fibrosis point of view, the focus has been around home spirometry, which we've shown can be conducted feasibly by patients in their own home. We have recognized a number of issues that still need to be overcome, but we're a good way down the road to doing that. And I think in the future, collection of uh, a, a greater collection of data, including pulse, oxygen saturation, and activity data, will probably better supplement the information from home spirometry and will allow us to better intervene uh, before problems develop in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So I think it's an exciting place to be at the moment, and hopefully we will continue to see improvements in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for those two great presentations we had. I really enjoyed uh, the presentations and I think the audience did too because I have um, quite some questions already coming up. Um, and I would like to start with just a positive comment because I think we should really um, value that as well, where someone is saying to you, Dr. Francis, thank you for the presentation. And I've been thinking about telehealth visit with my pulmonologist and armed with your information presented on the slides. Um, on what to do regarding um, the location room and questions. I took a photo and now I'm really happy to do uh, to start and do it. And she or he or she wishes you a good weekend. So I think that is a very good start on how the session is perceived and this gains a lot of interest. But now I would like to go to some more um, content wise um, questions. And there is quite some on pulmonary rehab and quite some on practical um, factors. So maybe let's um, start with the pulmonary rehab because both of you touched on that so maybe both of you can also answer um would you and i, I would like to first start with you dr fuentes and then uh, with you toby would you recommend a home-based pulmonary rehab program over a center-based cardiac rehab program for pulmonary fibrosis patients well that's a that's a very uh, interesting patient uh, i mean question um it, the home-based pulmonary rehab program uh, over uh, a center base, a center base um, is usually monitored by the the physiologist, the uh, respiratory therapist. You have a uh, the patient will have the um, uh, it will be closely monitored. Now, uh, home uh, there are some programs that are online by the especially by the pulmonary fibrosis organization. It requires a special patient. It requires a patient that is more condition, it, 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 it depends. Nothing replace a, um, a, um, a center-based um, program. Um, Toby, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Morik uh, Maher, you would like to comment on that too? Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think where possible, a center-based program ultimately has a lot extra to offer, particularly for rehabilitation. Um, but I, I think the evidence would suggest that remote rehabilitation, either in situations as we've just encountered with the COVID pandemic or for people who live too far from a dedicated centre, um, does offer a viable alternative. Um, you know, I, I think that the question as posed by the asker about cardiac rehab versus dedicated pulmonary rehab, I, I, I think I would always prefer dedicated pulmonary rehab because there is an important educational component to rehabilitation and, and that will be lost in anything that's designed for a cardiac patient. And I also think some of the exercises are going to be different as well. And, and what would you think? Because we know from these real-time pulmonary rehab uh, programs that the effect often wins out when you stop them. So in my idea, probably the ideal thing is to stop, start off in real time and continue or combine with virtual. Have you, do you have any experience with that? In short answer, no. No. <laughs> no, 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 no experience of that. But I, you know, I think it's an important area for research because, as you say, the historic problem with rehab is that, as with all exercise programs, whether we're doing it as, as part of getting fit or uh, as part of pulmonary rehab, we all tend to lapse into bad habits after a while. And I think the reinforcement that 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 potentially could go with having an online follow up would be very important. Okay. And there is another question um, if it would also work very well for transplant patients. I think it is the, the answer is probably in the line, but maybe Mary Luz, you want to comment on that because it's an, an extra vulnerable group as well. 
um, in the patients, I'm sorry, I follow. I, after I, transplant, if it would work as well after lung transplants. Yes, um, as a matter of fact, I, one of the, the things that I would recommend going through personal um, recent being transplanted about 90 days uh, ago, uh, one of the things that, that helped me tremendously was uh, doing the uh, pulmonary rehab. I can I cannot emphasize the importance of pulmonary rehab uh, pre-transplant and post-transplant. And again, what Dr. Maher said, um, I used to be in a, a uh, uh, pulmonary rehab where I went to a place uh, three times uh, a week and now I'm back home and I'm being very disciplined right now but not all the patients are like that um, but I think it, it, the continuation this is a commitment for life the way I see it this is a commitment for life it doesn't stop with the when you have a long transplant you have to this is a commitment for life so I will highly recommend continue to doing uh, either depending on um, your options. If you if you if you and again sometimes insurance only covers certain uh, sessions in um, uh, pre transplant or post transplant, but pulmonary rehab or or some kind of a established um, exercise needs to be done after. Yes. Thank you. The, the answers were really appreciated. That's also coming from the uh, audience. <laughs> that so you were thanked for your answers already. I would like to move to the, the more practical part of, of how to organize this, um, because there's there's different questions on reimbursements and on, on trans-state um, situations. This is for me difficult because I live in a very small country, uh, so I have no idea how your insurance system uh, works. So I'm just going to read the questions. In areas where the patient lives in one state and the doctor is licensed to practice in another state, Telehealth is an obvious solution. Some insurance and or regulations do allow the physician to treat the patient in another state. Are you aware of any advocacy or activity to address this situation? And maybe there's more questions also about um, does Medicare or any of the healthcare insurances cover telehealth, uh, telehealth visits? Um, do both of you want to comment on that, on your experiences? I'd like to comment on the first one. Uh, um... During the pandemic, we all were given, um, at least in the telehealth setting, uh, temporary licenses. Um, I had uh, at least four or five uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the ones that I currently hold as a permanent that were given during the pandemic um, because of the situation. So in telehealth um, law, you have to be licensed in the state where the patient is at. So. In the case of that patient that had uh, cancer, uh, probably that physician has had a temporary license. I had some, and by the end of the pandemic, officially ended up, those licenses were taken away. So that's probably what happened. I don't think there is a way to uh, do any kind of advocacy. This was just a, um, uh, an emergency situation. I don't know what Dr. Maher might want to comment into that or in the second part of the young um, question. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I mean, the, the pandemic really created a situation where a, a lot of the rules were looked at and changed to deal with the situation at hand. But I, I, I think it's also highlighted areas where bureaucracy perhaps gets in the way of, of patient care. And I, I think we all recognise that the challenge of, of state boundaries precluding seeing a patient being somewhat um sort of archaic and ridiculous uh, i'm for instance i see patients from nevada face to face in my clinic but i can't see them by telemedicine unless they drive over the state border uh, and and call me from their car uh, and i i think the the new england journal actually has been publishing a number of articles on this looking at how the federal government might address the issue of state by state medical licensing um because it, it, it really is something that was designed for a previous century. And I think with the move to telehealth, uh, it, it, it's going to be important that it's revisited. And I, I guess um, groups like the PFF are going to be well-placed to try and advocate for patients and get some flexibility in the rules around telemedicine strategies. And there's an important remark on that also coming up in a chat that the National Organization for Rare Diseases is also doing an advocacy um, on, on the telehealth. So this to me sounds really needed in your, your big country with all these different states, because I think that is the whole benefit of the, the telehealth, that it is beyond uh, boundaries and borders. Um, 
I think there's also a more technical question on the home spirometry. Is there a particular range that the home spirometer should uh, show to ensure there is no problem? Toby, can you maybe um, comment on this question? I'm not sure if it is about the medical limits or if it is a, a technical sound check. What's yeah, I, I, I think um, in general, when we did our study, if I'm on, hopefully I'm answering the question correctly, but when we did our study, we, we sort of accepted that there would be some day-to-day -day variation in, in people's readings. And, and we know that physiologically, even people with healthy lungs will have different FVC readings, depending on the time of day, depending on when they most recently ate, um, you know, depending on certain technical factors with the spirometer they're using. So some variability is expected. Um, and we sort of set a threshold of 10% as the level of variability that we felt fell outside of that normal technical variance. Um, and so I, I think for people who might be doing home monitoring, and there are some um, patient-based apps available uh, that, that offer this now, I think if patients are monitoring it for themselves, if they see a reading that's more than 10% different from their baseline, and that, that happens on a, at least two consecutive days, that's the point at which I would um, look to talk to, to your local healthcare provider, whether that's the PCP or whether it's your, your hospital, just to review whether there is an explanation for that change. And it, it might be early infection, it, it might be other problems, but I, I think that 10% threshold is probably the, the best one to use at the moment. And uh, Dr. Fuentes, what's your experience in this? How, how do you deal with this in your clinic? Um, actually, I don't do clinic. I, I basically do some uh, strictly telehealth. <laughs> yeah, but you don't use the home spirometer there for consultations. Well, it's some patients that do have some uh, chronic uh, conditions do have some um, uh, spirometers at home. I must say, I do yes. consider telehealth also as a clinic because I, I think there is no way around yes. it anymore. This will yeah. be our future clinics and it will probably mix, but it will not... I don't think we can take it away anymore for medicine. COVID has really Absolutely. forced that on. Um, there is also, um, yeah, there's, there's also, um, again, from the audience that they really much, very much agree on uh, that the laws should be changed. So there is a lot of support. So I think you have uh, quite some to gain. Very short, short answer to a question to both of you. Um, is the physical examination not missed? So I, I so I, I think for patients where there has been a very clear change in symptoms, if they have new symptoms or worsening of existing symptoms, then I think the physical examination is very important. But I, I think when it's a troubleshooting visit, when it's an opportunity to talk about exercise, rehabilitation, medicine side effects and all of that, then I, I think the physical examination is less important. Um, and from my view, I like to try and mix up in person with telehealth. So all telehealth is bad, but equally, I don't think we need to do everything in person either. Thanks. We really have to stop with that. It was a great session. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for that. We have not managed to answer one or two questions, but um, I think this was really wonderful. We learned a lot. Also, thanks to the um, Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation for um, inviting all of us, I think, to talk about this topic. Um, and I wish everybody a, a very good conference. Thank you for being moder moderating the, the session as well. Thank you for being such great uh, speakers and sharing also your personal experiences. That was really special. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Great.